I would like to begin by thanking the organization for this uh, wonderful, wonderful event. Well, for the opportunity to be here, as well as to all of you listening to us for your time and patience. And uh, so without further ado, let us begin. Uh, okay. Deleuze's account on the theme of death draws explicitly from Maurice Blanchot's idea that death has two aspects. There is a doubleness in death. On one hand, personal death, a death that concerns the I or the ego, death as present, as an ultimate and monumental moment, in Blanchot's words, where I would die in the affirmation of my own reality and my unique existence. On the other hand, impersonal death, death, and I quote, as the abyss of the present, time without a present, with which I have no relation, that toward which I cannot go forth, for in it I do not die, je ne mors pas, I have fallen from the power to die, in it they die, on meurt, they do not cease, and they do not finish dying. A suggestion emphasized multiple times by Deleuze, after all, and I quote from A Différence et Répétition, there is always a day die more profound than an I die. And it, and it is not only the gods who die endlessly and in a variety of ways. Idea further developed in Logique du Sang. How different this day is from that which we encounter in everyday banality. It is the day of impersonal and pre-individual singularities the day of the pure event wherein it dies in the same way that it rains. The splendor of the day is the splendor of the event itself. Impersonal death is the endless movement that each time deprives me of the power to say I. In it, to say it still with Blanchot, I am but a trace, a vestige, the impression that will be transformed. And death, impersonal death, is precisely linked here to transformation, to the infinitude of the metamorphosis, which leads us not only to death, again Blanchot, but infinitely, infinitely transmutes death itself, which makes of death the infinite movement of dying and of him who dies, him who is infinitely dead, l'infiniment mort. As we are beginning to understand, this movement is therefore not only about the iterative disruption of any form of security configured in terms of identity, of self-certainty, of a self as the foundation of possibility, of meaning, but a permanent injunction of initiality. And I quote again Blanchot, where endlessly everything starts over and where dying itself is a task without end. This injunction of initiality is central to Deleuze's reading of the problem of death. And death, for Deleuze, is precisely problematic. The last form, he says, of the problematic, the source of problems and questions. An impersonal itinerary, the philosophy suggests, with no relation to me, neither present nor past, but always coming, the source of an incessant, multiple adventure in a persistent question. The element of the adventure that the philosophy announces is its persistence. Death is always coming, toujours à venir. This means that death not only will remain indefinitely perfectible and always insufficient in future, but belonging to the time of the promise, it will always remain in each of its future times to come. As in Blanchot, death is never present. It remains the theme of a non-presentable concept and therefore not the term, life's term, terma to bio, to remember the famous last verse of Oedipus Tyrannos, but the interminable, always to come. The temporal adverb is indeed decisive, always, toujours, suggests Emile Bonveniste, is the imperfect but common translation of the Greek, I. This always, clarifies the linguist, indicates what is perpetually recommenced before being a permanent and immovable always. Precisely in this sense, Deleuze defines death as source, there is, as a beginning, each time a beginning, insofar as every beginning, to use Heidegger's words, 
is not ever behind us, but always anew in front of us. The itinerary of Buster Keaton on Baggett's film gives us further elements of analysis of the couple death and permanent beginning. The last deals at length with film in chapter four of Cinema en Limal Mouvement, starting from the following question. How can we rid ourselves of ourselves and demolish ourselves? This is the astonishing attempt, he says, made by Beckett in his cinematographic work entitled Film. Can we escape, further demands the philosopher, from the appendices of the percipere and the percipi? Film can be divided into three parts. In the first, we see the character or the object, O, according to Beckett's nomenclature, in flight, hurriedly covering a certain spatial extension along the wall before entering a building and climbing a staircase, always sticking to the edge of the wall. At this stage, the object is subject to the following formal convention. The camera, or the eye, E, can only film from the back, can only film him from the back, from an angle that cannot ever exceed the 45 degrees. When the eye yet exceeds this angle of immunity, the action is immediately suspended. The object experiences, writes Beckett, the anguish of perceivedness, interrupting his march and hiding the exposed part of his face. As a result, the eye tries to respect this convention for the most part of the film. At the second moment, or the second part, the object has entered the room and insofar as he is no longer against a wall, the angle of reference of the eye doubles, 45 degrees on each side. The object observes subjectively the contents of the room, things, animals. The eye, on the other end, objectively perceives at the same time the room, the object, and the elements towards which the object projects his gaze. The eye cannot yet exceed 90 degrees behind, 90 degrees behind the object, but the following convention is added. The object must empty the room, expel the animals, cover the mirrors and the elements which can act as mirrors, windows, frames, photographies. This exercise aims to extinguish the object's point of view, to eliminate the subjective perception. Only the objective perception of the eye should remain. At this point, the object can finally install himself in the rocking chair in the center of the room and rock gently with his eyes closed. Finally, at the third and final stage of the film, the greatest danger is revealed. The extinction of the subjective perception of the object has freed the eye from any kind of convention that limits its movement. The eye then advances carefully through the available space into the domain of the remaining 270 degrees. At times, the object wakes and regaining a scrap of subjective perception, hides, curls up and forces the eye to fall back. Finally, taking advantage of the object's torpor, the eye succeeds in coming round and facing him. The object is now seen from the front and the last convention is unveiled. The pursuing perceiver writes back at, is not extraneous, but self. We are in the domain, suggests Deleuze, of the perception of affection, the most terrifying, that, we, that which still survives when all the others have been destroyed. It is the perception of self by self, la perception de soi par soi. Face to face with himself, the object realizes that it is impossible not being seen. The perception of, self, of the self Self-perception, however, doesn't lead to identification, but to disquiet, uncanniness. What is uncanny is unfamiliar, beyond our ken, and thus unsettling, disquieting. The self is no less foreign, no less strange than all the other selves. The last convention reveals the meaning of the itinerary. Film concerns a pursuit. The vicissitudes of a pursuit not just any pursuit in any case between different subjects, but a pursuit of the self by the self, the self pursuit of a self that wants to identify himself, to fully conceive himself as such, but that does not exist after all, beyond the fracture that makes him perpetually differ from himself. 
as the Portuguese philosophy, philosopher Tomás Maia rightfully suggests, film must be understood in terms of a quest. It accomplishes what may be called the human quaestio, the quest, a quest with no other object than the unobjectifiable openness of the one who pursues. Therefore, at the end of the pursuit of every quaestio worthy of the name, there is no revealable self, no ideal interiority that would fill in meaning the itinerary undertaken, no end of the pursuit. It is precisely what films and sequency gives us to see and to think. First, the object bowed forward, his head in his hands, gently rocking. Then, a clear cut to a black screen. Finally, the lift of an eyelid, an open eye, the same image we had saw at the beginning of the film, the open eye that had inaugurated the pursuit, the quaestio. And so, at the end of the pursuit, of the quest, nothing but to remain in pursuit, in question, to fail again, nothing else ever, a pursuit for nothing. Beckett's film invites us to understand cinema, what there is of cinema, of movement in cinema, in terms of suspense, of an unlimited postponement. The character is positioned before his nothingness, each time the impossibility of identifying himself, his own self, and to finally being able to die an authentic, proper death. Death, writes Thomas Meyer, bleeds, but does not die. That is all that art gives us to see and probably to know. Death inspires, but itself does not expire. In Les Puissies, Deleuze proposes to consider Beckett's characters from an essential exhaustion, condition that must not be confused with simple tiredness. The tired, clarifies the verse, no longer prepares for any possibility, subjective. It therefore cannot realize the smallest possibility, objective. The possibility of possibility, however, remains intact, since we can never realize all of the possible. The tired has only exhausted realization. The exhausted, in turn, exhausted all of the possible. He exhausts himself in exhausting the possible. And I quote Deleuze once again, he has had done with the possible beyond all tiredness for to end yet again, pour en finir encore. What is affected here, exhausted precisely, is the idea of a simple and unmodified, indifferent origin that is always already at work every time we enter the domain of the possible, that is, as the possible of a merely represented possibilitas, the essentia of an actus of existencia. God, writes Deleuze, is the originary, the ensemble of all possibility. The possibility is thus a question of derivation, of consequence. We realize the possible according to certain capabilities into certain finalities, projects and preferences that fundamentally vary, forever excluding or substituting predecessors. This series of exclusions and substitutions produce precisely fatigue. Exhaustion proceeds in an entirely different way. I quote, you combine a set of variables of a situation provided you renounce all order of preference and all organization of goal, all signification, which is not to say that the exhausted inhabits or is inhabited by a fundamental indifference or passivity. The exhausted activates himself, but for nothing. In a world freed, to put it in Nietzsche's words, from servitude under purpose. This freedom is entirely relative to the withdrawal of the self in and as the immovable foundation of the succession of variable preferences. Beckett's characters are precisely this withdrawal, the endless exhaustion of the ontotheological place of the self, its interminable death. Be always dead in Eurydice. A famous passage from Rilke's sonnets perfectly preserves the challenge that Beckett's characters pose, the cinema that they are. But always dead, clarifies Blanchot, is echoed by always alive. And here alive does not signify life, but the loss of the power to die, the loss of death as power and possibility. We must consider, first suggests Blanchot, 
a nameless being, a being without being who can neither live nor die, cannot cease or begin with a perseverance that does not indicate any power, but rather the curse of what cannot be interrupted, neither live nor die. The perseverance, he says, of an in-between without subordination. What perseveres, what remains between life and death is life, death, la vie, la mort, as an inseparable constellation. Deleuze, precisely in this regard, is interest in a certain involution, but involution does not mean regression leading back to principle. To involute, writes the philosopher, is to be between, in the middle, adjacent. Beckett's characters are in perpetual involution, always in the middle of a path, already en route, on the way to nothing, for nothing. We must therefore consider an iteration in which form is constantly being dissolved. And so to involve means for the less to endlessly involve. After all, he says, nothing is ever finished in Beckett. Nothing ever dies. Nothing, not even death. Let us consider before concluding the following passage from L'Immanence une vie. What is immanence? What is immanence? Alive. No one has described what alive is better than Charles Dickens when he takes the indefinite, indefinite article as an index of the transcendental. A scoundrel, a bad hairball held in contempt by everyone is found as it lies dying. Moran writes less, and certainly those charged with his care display an urgency, respect, and even love for the dying man's least sign of life. Everyone makes its business to save him. As a result, the wicked man himself, in the depths of his coma, feels something soft and sweet penetrate his soul. But as he progresses back toward life, his benefactors turn cold, and he himself rediscovers his old vulgarity and meanness. Between his life and his death, there is a moment where a life is merely playing with death. The life of the individual has given away to an impersonal and yet singular life, which foregrounds a pure event that has been liberated from the accidents of internal and external life, that is, from the subjectivity and the objectivity of what comes to pass. End of quotation. Between life and death, as the very in-between between life and death, le mourant is undying death as impersonal life, irreducible to accidents, lived experience, states of affairs, to the egocratic apparatus of a subject, a self. What interests the less, we have seen it at length, is not death, definitive death as agency to a definitive transition, but its impossibility, the impossibility of death of end ending. Now, suggests in the same manner Blanchot, there is nothing to do but to struggle, to work at dying completely. But if you struggle, you are still alive. Lutte, c'est vivre encore. And everything that brings the goal closer also makes the goal inaccessible. Still, writes Blanchot, encore. Here's the element of the movement, of the movement that we must consider, the persistence of deferment to live, die, still. Beckett's character, suggests the nurse, are always involving, there is, not in a process toward totalization, but perpetually decreasing. Better, to use a word from Roger Laporte, the title of the last of his autobiographic works, Moriendo, consider precisely, to finish, the end paragraph, paragraph of Laporte's book. Continue to pursue, he writes, what's the point? When, but I can say exactly what happened at the moment when I was ready to capitulate, when abandoned by myself, I could not bear my own mourning, the misfortune lightened and I experienced a semblance of serenity. The time of the ordeal was coming to an end, but in spite of everything, the imperative incomprehensibly had not changed. This injunction that was too important for me and to which, therefore, I will once again, une fois encore, try to be faithful to pursuit. When abandoned by himself, by the very possibility of finding himself, his own self, at the end of the pursuit, the imperative 
incomprehensibly enough, had not changed. To pursue encore, to die still, once again, without ever being able to bear his own mourning, to have an identifiable something, identifiable something to mourn. Moriendo rightly suggests Jean-Luc Nancy is not finishing, it is unfinishing, for to finish yet again, to finish still. The object, the character of Beckett's film is not a mere character from a film. It is not a character at all. It does not bear the mark, the incision, the stamp of an ideal prototype, of a stationary self to be found, unveiled at the end of his cinematographic itinerary. In this sense, film might give us cinema's ultimate character. There is adequate to its interminable movement, Lazarus. Not the Lazarus from the Gospels, the character of a miraculous story, of a prodigious operation, he who goes into death to pass through it, to transgress it by regaining his life, materializing a resurrection that delecticizes death, making it, making it a necessary stage in the service of the constitution of meaning, of an ontotheological program, but the other Lazarus. Blanche shows Lazarus. So Lazar, veritable, the only true Lazarus, he says, whose very death, writes Blanchot, was resurrected. Death is the subject. The subject is not or is no longer its own subject. As Jean Nancy explains, such are the stakes of resurrection, neither subjectivation nor objectivation, neither the resurrected nor the dead body, but death resurrected the ever-returning event of its persistence beyond any kind of suspension. And the event, as Deleuze famously put it, is that no one ever dies, but has always just died and is always going to die. Vient toujours de mourir et va toujours mourir. I thank you all for your time.